But there's one thing that mostly has been underlying all the propositions and uh, ideas that we've been hearing about, and that thing is the uh, capabilities of digital technologies and internet communication. So in a way, underpinning um, all that we've heard, all these projects, all these dreams, um, is the ideas we have about technology and the ability that we give technology to carry those dreams through. Um, so I think it's a good way to finish uh, the conference to uh, talk about uh, these dreams, to talk about the stories uh, that we build around technology. And to do that, um, I'm very pleased to introduce James Bridal, who is a writer, a published, and uh, describes himself as a technologist. Um, he comes from the world of uh, com computer technology, but also um, from the world of book publishing. So he's been very close to the way in which technology has affected the publishing industry. Um, he's going to talk about technology and the name of the title of his talk is Metaphors Considered Harmful. So please, a very warm welcome to James Bridle. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's an honor, it's been a really fascinating couple of days. Um, and I know I'm the only thing standing between you and beer, so I'll try and keep this going. Um, this is a picture of me talking to a machine. Well, in fact, I'm not even talking. The machine is reading my face. Um, it's, a, it's a machine that plays chess. Uh, it's a chess playing computer, but it's augmented with facial recognition. Uh, so it can tell something about the mood of the person it's playing against and react more to it as part of a larger project that I'll come back and talk to later, but I just love what it said about me. I'm looking at the game board, average interest, slightly confused, um, which is pretty much how I look at everything. Um, uh, this is man raised gravestone, it's my favourite phrase in the world. Um, it says unconcerned, but not indifferent. Um, which is kind of how I look at all of the stuff. I'm not a designer, but some of the things that I do end up looking like design. Um, I'm still just about a publisher, um, but I maintain the same thing. In fact, when I went to a book conference earlier this year, I accidentally managed to get that phrase onto my conference pass, which somewhat confused everyone. Um, I like this as an approach. I can see across different things, hopefully. I want to introduce you to some friends of mine. These are the Render Ghosts. They live inside the buildings we haven't built yet. I'm sure you've seen some of them around. Uh, they inhabit this deeply strange world. Um, they kind of walk around it. They often look quite busy. They go backwards, they go forwards. Um, they walk sort of seemingly endlessly. Um, they exist in this kind of slightly half world. Um, but they're, they're trying to make a go of it. Um, they know that this is the world in, in which they have to live, it's the one they find themselves in. It's a weird world. It looks very strange to our eyes because it's sort of mediated through technology. Um, but still, you know, you do what you do, people get on, the children play. Sometimes you can see them kind of looking out at us, wondering what it is that we're doing, that we're doing to them. Sometimes they look a bit afraid, a little bit nervous, but most of all they just kind of look around, trying to understand their surroundings. Sometimes they fall in love. Uh, most of the time, in fact a lot of the time they do party, there's a lot of partying in the Render Ghost world, but most of the time they sort of do this, they just sort of stand on balconies, looking out into this strange world. And I love the Render Ghosts, because they seem to stand for something about how we understand and think about technology the way we kind of situate ourselves inside it um, and, and, and use various tools, all kinds of tools, to kind of project it forwards. I'm very concerned with the way the render ghosts and the visualisation techniques kind of produce architecture in the world, but it stands for the ways in which all of our technologies 
produce and shape things in the world, and I'll come back to that too. Um, but I should mention the new aesthetic quickly, which is sort of why I'm here. The new aesthetic was a project that I undertook for, I'm still undertaking. It was visible on the web more so for about a year. And I used, I employed images like this to talk about it. This is the, uh, this is a proposed, never happened, livery for Virgin Atlantic um, by a fantastic illustrator called Andy Gilmore. What's fantastic about this livery is they decided that they wanted to make a plane that would look really good on the internet. The point of this is that people would see this thing and it was something that kind of had to be photographed and put on the internet. They're, they're creating a whole aeroplane, a whole fleet of aeroplanes designed to look good on Facebook in little images. Um, because the new aesthetic was about sort of crossing these boundaries between the digital and the physical. A lot of people seem to think it's an art movement or it's purely about the digital erupting into the physical, but for me it's always been far more than that. It's been about living in the world where things like this exist, or in this case don't exist, but are considered are thought of as part of the world. Um, it's about living in the world and trying to understand how these things overlap in all kinds of different ways. I want to give you some examples of things that I found interesting. Um, the cloud. The cloud is a fun thing. We hear quite a lot about the cloud these days, cloud computing. That the internet, in some ways, is kind of vast, ethereal outsourcing system um, where all of our dreams and memories and work will sort of ascend into this, into this invisible thing. But the cloud is a lie. The cloud isn't a cloud at all. The cloud is sheds, massive, huge sheds filled with more computers. But we kind of willfully push them away. We try not to think about them too much. We don't have ways of understanding this process that's happening as we build these kind of huge spaces in which to do computation, in which to do processing. So we kind of keep them away, even though this is sort of one of the places where all this stuff happens. This is a Google one in the Netherlands. Uh, Google builds slightly prettier data centers. Um, this, is, this is the new civic architecture. This is where your banking happens. This is where uh, your dating happens for some of you, many of you, I would imagine, certainly for me. This is where everything, a lot of stuff that used to happen in cities between people happens here. But it doesn't really happen here, does it? It happens kind of everywhere. This is confusing. We don't know what this means yet. And you get really weird ones like this one, which is my favourite. Um, this is a data centre in East London. It's part of the third largest single internet switching point in the world, uh, the London Link Exchange. Um, but this, this, there's something about this building that obsesses me, because the architect's trying to do something here. I mean, this is a shed. This is a shed. This is something else. This is trying to show something. Right? What's all this patterning on the front about? It's attempting to say that something computery is going on here, but we're not sure what, not, what it is, and we're not sure how to explain it to you. But we're, we need to start exploring ways to represent this, because these things are all around us all the time. And it's not just the outside of the buildings either, it's the insides of them as well that are changing in these strange, technologically mediated ways. This is an Amazon warehouse around Christmas time. Uh, it's the largest one in the UK, one of the largest ones in the world. Um, what's insane about the new Amazon warehouses is they're not arranged for humans. Um, the stuff that's stored in this warehouse is not stored like a human would store it. Um, it's stored algorithmically and it's, it's attempts to evenly distribute it. So it's not a huge pile of books over here, and a pile of DVDs over here, and a pile of you know, toys over here. These things are all mixed up by algorithms to ensure that when someone needs to go and get something, wherever they are in the warehouse, they have the shortest path to each of those things. And that's brilliant, except no human can navigate that. You need technology to be able to sort your way through this. If the technology breaks down, then you know, you're lost in this huge sea of stuff. This is how a computer stores stuff, but we're putting it out into the world. 
There's a term for this that I only learned quite recently, but that's really fascinating. Um, it's uh, by a couple of software researchers called uh, Martin Dodge and Rob Kitchen. And they describe spaces like this as code spaces. Um, this, is th this is their kind of core example, uh, an airport departure lounge, right? So we know what this is, and we know how this space is supposed to function. It functions by a number of software systems moving your baggage around, and checking you in, and funneling you through, and all that kind of stuff. But this isn't just an architectural space because of those systems. This is also a software space. It's a code space. If, this, if the software fails, the architecture fails because the two are co-created. I might use co-creation as slightly different, or at least as quite a non-human way for the way it's been discussed so far, but there's a co-creation occurring here between architecture and software in order to make this space function. If the software fails, it's just another shed full of increasingly angry people. But my contention is we can take this quite a lot further and say that code spaces kind of extend far, far wider than that. That they cover um, almost all of our interactions now. That everything we do is, is co-produced with the technology. I think we've heard a lot so far about co-producing between people and not very much about how we're co-producing those things with the, the technologies behind them that we're also creating. All of this stuff is code space. Every time you interact with a piece of software, a piece of technology, you're interacting with um, a whole range of other systems that shape the work that's being done. And I find this incredibly fascinating. Um, this is uh, a project of mine from a few years ago. Um, it's called Menace, which stands for uh, one second, Machine Educable Noughts and Crosses Engine. This is a computer that plays noughts and crosses. Um, tic tac toe. For, no, everyone guesses noughts and crosses, right? Good. Um, Menace was a thought experiment from the 19 early 1960s by an artificial intelligence professor called Donald Ritchie um, at uh, Glasgow University. Um, it's basically the most, one of the more complex computers you can build by hand. Um, what's clever about Menace is it doesn't just play uh, noughts and crosses. And it plays it, by the way, by having uh, about 300, just over 300 matchboxes <laughs> filled with coloured beads. Each one of those matchboxes represents a, um, uh, a potential board position. You match the board position to the matchbox, which has the board position also on the top. You shake it and you pop out a coloured bead, and, uh, and, that, and that defines where the machine plays next. So you can play against the machine. What's clever is that it learns over time. Every time the machine plays, um, you keep those matchboxes aside, and um, if the machine wins, you reinforce it by putting more beads in, so that um, it's more likely to play that move the next time. So this is an artificially intelligent machine. It learns over time until it can play a perfect game of noughts and crosses, which is boring because a noughts and crosses perfect game is a draw, but it's very, very clever. But it's also the kind of limits of what we can feel with our hands, right? It's, the, it's, it's approaching the limits of what people can do mechanically that computers can do, and it's, it's really not very much. So it's an attempt at an illustration of quite how vast those systems are, um, that we can only grasp these tiny edges of them at all times, and we need to be aware of that. This is another example. This is, this is a bit of a rant, but it's freaking me out at the moment, so I want to tell you about it. Um, this is the Mechanical Turk. Does anyone know what the Mechanical Turk was? Mechanical Turk was a very famous early automaton. Um, it was a, a chess playing robot um, from about uh, 150 years ago. Well, it was when it was all proposed, there were myths about it, not everyone actually installed one, all this kind of stuff. But there were, there were working examples of the Mechanical Turk. It was, a, it was a chess playing robot. You could go and sit in front of it, make your moves, and the machine would, would move the chess pieces around. Um, and it was very, very famous and everyone thought it was the most extraordinary thing ever, until they discovered there was a small person in the box underneath it all the time um, that, was, that was making it work. It was a kind of grand mechanical hoax. Um, but the idea of the mechanical turf survived, uh, and it survived always with people attached, interestingly. So you might well have heard of Amazon's mechanical turf, which is a system for um, breaking down small tasks into um, into manageable chunks. 
so that you can pay people to do very, very tiny ones. So this is someone who's uh, uh, doing things like you know, basic tasks that are amenable to machine processing, i.e. you can break them down into step-by-step -step tasks, but people are just slightly better at them than machines, like classifying images or um, finding addresses on the internet and that kind of thing. So they've broken it down into all these tiny, tiny tasks, and they're paying like five cents or even one cent a job to do them. And so you outsource, outsource this mechanical task back to people again. Um, and the terrifying, to me anyway, end consequence of this kind of thing is this. Uh, there's a couple of websites like this. This one's called TaskRabbit. Um, it's currently out in San Francisco, and Austin, and New York, and a few US cities, but they're spreading. And there's a couple of other versions as well in other places. This is, this is like direct. This is just paying people to do stuff for you. This wasn't what I wanted the internet to do. This wasn't where I thought we go with the internet, of kind of, a kind of fractal capitalism that allows you to kind of get any task reduced to its kind of tiny core and you keep parceling that out. And I don't, I don't want this, <laughs> but this is the kind of natural end of that kind of machine-oriented, technology-led design and where it would take us. And um, some design processes that take on those technolo technological metaphors end up producing things like this that boom slightly, slightly odd to us. This is another other weird example. So the, the, um, the robot I was talking to at the start of the talk, the facial recognition chess playing thing, um, he's, he's iCat, this guy. Um, uh, so he also stimulates facial uh, uh, movements himself in order to talk back to you. This is all part of a big European project that's just come to the end um, that various people I know were involved in called Lyric, which was about um, producing new kinds of robots, in particular producing companion robots, which is a really interesting thing. This comes out of the realisation most people we have an ageing population and we need to look after them uh, and they don't just need to be stuck in homes, they need to be kept you know, stimulated and they need to be happy and maybe robots can do this. Um, and I'm actually completely fine with that, um, up to a point. I, I, I think it's a really interesting and very important area of research. Um, not least because it produces some really weird and more interesting stuff. Um, like this, um, at this conference thing, these talks I went to, they talked a lot about migration. Um, so what they mean by migration is basically transferring the emotional state of one of these robot companions. <coughs> They're particularly working with this, which is a commercially available toy called Cleo, who's a little dinosaur. Does everyone remember that like, Ivo, the little Sony dog? Um, Cleo is like a you know, five, six, seven years on, more advanced version of Ivo. So like, he's got like, touch sensors all over him, so you can stroke him, and he's kind of really into that. And he has all these behaviors. He also, he learns, right? He has kind of rudimentary prototype emotions and they can be changed and affected by what he learns and um, how, he, how he's treated and he recognises people and individuals. A um, whole range of really interesting behaviours. The one thing he was really bad at when Lyric approached him was that um, he, uh, it, when he ran out of batteries, it tended to freak people out, um, particularly children, uh, who'd been playing with this thing for ages and suddenly just, you know, and usually they started crying. Um, they basically like Cleo's dead, uh, or like, at least all, like, I killed Cleo. Even worse, what did I do? To kind of, you know, major issue there. So one of the things they did was focus on migration, which was taking this emotional. T how do you complete a complete? How do you build a complete construction of Cleo? Of Cleo's kind of mind state, his his emotions, his history, everything that he knows package that up and put it somewhere else. And they did this really nice thing, which is that um, Cleo now has a battery sensor in him. So he knows when he's running low on batteries. And he starts to simulate tiredness, so he sort of hangs the head, slows down, starts to sort of curl up. So that by the time he is out actually of batteries, he's sleeping. And then his state gets transferred to a, a, a kind of construct on a phone, another little avatar, by Cleo, I think is his name, and it sort of pops up there. And it's like, hey, it's all right, it's still here. You know, could you have plugged me in? Um, and so that's a really nice solution to the problem. But 
what they're doing here is also, I think, really interesting. No one would talk about it because we're not allowed to talk about it. But they're talking about transhumanism. They're talking, essentially, about how you back up memories and experiences and therefore people. And like, it just struck me that that's where this thing is going, right? That's where the migration research, that's going to spin off way out of robotics quite soon and become its whole entire kind of research to itself. These problem domains kind of, we, we, we've developed robotics as a way of talking about some of these issues. But the domain overlaps massively with a whole bunch of other things that are going to be of greater concern soon. Um, there was a reason for this slide. Um, the other thing that really struck me was that they were really... That there was this kind of internal tension within the whole project around um, what we're basing these companions on. Um, if I go back a couple to this one, you can see they're trying out these kind of different forms. You've got a little robot dinosaur, you've got cat, you've got these more... We've got something that's going for quite a lot of anthropomorphism. You've got something that's going for something that looks a lot more like a cartoon robot. But the real question is actually how these things behave, what their kind of what their emotional patterns are based on. Um, and there was this tension within the group that said between like making them like people or making them like pets, right? Because it turns out actually it's really hard to make things like people, but you can make things that are like pets a bit more interestingly. Um, and we've got you know we've, we've lived with pets, particularly dogs, for a very 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 long time. We have co-evolved with them, so we understand a whole bunch of stuff. Um, there's actually an amazing amount of communication happening all the time between people and their dogs. There's a lot of stuff around like where the animal is looking, it will actually like make you look in the same place uh, to kind of tell you stuff. It's incredibly powerful. But I was also particularly struck that this was a whole bunch of serious engineers, some of them philosophers, kind of um, people really thinking about how these things would think, and yet they were kind of it was always based on what have we done for 10,000 years? Like, because that's what we'll be able to understand. Like, we've done it this way for this long, so we'll just make robots like this bit of evolution and then everything will be fine. And it struck me a little bit that a lot of their problems were the fact that they were attempting to model this entirely new domain on stuff that had gone before for thousands and thousands of years. And that possibly, some other solution might be found somewhere else. Because I, I used to study artificial intelligence, and, um, and we, we based it very much then on evolutionary psychology, which is, a, which is a, an area which isn't actually so much in favour anymore. Um, we can't necessarily base everything that we do on the, the domains that existed previously. Because you get stuck in a thing, you get stuck in your own domain, this is my favourite image of that stuckness within an idea. This is from the last pages of Alan Moore's graphic novel from Hell about the Jack the Ripper murders. And he describes this shape. He's talking about how people obsess over this particular event, over the, the Jack the Ripper murders in London in 1888. And he describes a cock snowflake, which is a fractal. Fractals can be dangerous and weird too. Um, this is how you construct it. You keep adding triangles. The thing about cock snowflake is, you keep adding all the triangles you want, and the border will get longer and longer and longer, but the overall area will never get beyond a certain area. You can't just keep adding complexity to a thing. Right? You have to go outside that at some point and find different things. Which brings us back again, I think, to the new aesthetic, which is... Actually, that wasn't what I was going to talk about here. I want to talk about something else here. I want to talk about the future Norships, which is an essay I read recently that I highly uh, recommend you read. Um, it's an essay in terms about how we accommodate futures, how we understand them. The idea that the future isn't something that's kind of always distant to us out there, it's something that's always kind of passing through us, that we're always constantly adapting to by kind of expanding boundaries. But how we expand those boundaries is, we do that by choice, we do it by creating new metaphors for things, for creating new stories to kind of adapt how we understand the world a little bit further, to kind of push it out just that little bit more. Um, uh, and the example given in the essay is uh, of air travel. Um, it's a really good example, so I urge you to read the essay, it's far better than I'll explain it. But the simple, answer, the simple part of the flight story is that 
you could kind of explain flight to someone who lived 200 years ago. Um, and in fact, you could explain it because we've, we've, changed, we've made the experience of flight so understandable to ourselves. Right? Even the experience of flight, not even explaining it to someone, is basically like going on a very fast carriage ride, right? You go somewhere, you get on a thing, you get off in a distant place, and the whole experience is managed to make it as comfortable and safe and kind of recognisable as possible. Right? The whole thing is like a calming experience. Whereas actually, commercial flight can do completely mental stuff to you. They, they, they use commercial airliners to simulate zero G, but we don't do that because it would make us vomit. Right? That's where the future nauseous part of it comes from. We need to kind of manage these weird things that we can now do in order to make them comprehensible to us. Um, so, as you might have my background is in books and publishing. So I look at what's happening to books now, and I think this is the bit that might be particularly relevant to kind of open design, unexpected consequences, and so on. Uh, this is Gurgaon in India. Um, this is one of the centers for book digitization. The process that happens when a book is actually turned into an e-book, um, I find this fascinating. The books are kind of sent off to India, and they're typed up by people, uh, some of them. Some of them are just scanned and OCR. Other ones are actually typed up by people and then checked. And this is happening to all of literature right now. All the books, certainly all of Western European literature, is currently being like sent to India and sent back to us in this strange digital form. It's kind of an incredible process that we're not really paying attention to. But I, I genuinely believe that that's producing something different. Um, it can't be the same thing. We must have a different experience of this thing. And how is it different? And what, the main thing is, that I, I believe in many times, it is literally change. Um, this is a, another project of mine I did last year, kind of examining this. I took um, Charles Dickens' uh, novel, uh, Hard Times, uh, and I went through it, and uh, I, made, I made some changes to it. In fact, I made uh, 50 changes to it altogether. Um, this is 50 seemingly identical copies of a novel um, uh, that each one has a, a slight difference to it. Each one is a, um, it, it could be something big, um, in, some, in some like a character dies, or a character who dies lives, or um, the whole action takes place in a whole other country, or a big change. Some of them it's just a word, you know, a colour, the name of a street. You can kind of play with them, alter them a little bit. But what I'm trying to get at is the way in which this interaction, this translation from form to form, changes the thing profoundly. Um, and of course, as soon as I did this, I discovered that this is happening anyway. Um, these are two books that a friend of mine brought back from Peru. They're two pirate editions of, um, of the same novel, but they're fundamentally different. Uh, they have different names in them. One of them has, one of them, the ending is different. I'm not sure which is right, but they have different endings in these seemingly identical books. This is what's already happening like in, to physical books in the real world. The stories are changed every time they kind of engage with different working practices and different cultures. But it's way weirder stuff that's happening on the internet. That's printed books, but you know, what people get up to on the internet is deeply, deeply odd. Uh, I'm obsessed with fan fiction, um, with the way people engage with stories online, because I think it provides a model for how people will engage with all culture, uh, which includes design in the future. Um, fan fiction is when people write their own stories into into existing ones. So the more popular a story is, the more fan fiction there's going to be of it. Um, so you know, there's very large bodies of Harry Potter's uh, fan fiction, Star Trek fan fiction, all those kind of stuff. Um, but what this is, is people who genuinely, they, they don't care about permission, obviously. Um, and they don't care that, uh, uh, that things are not of the canon. They don't care that, um, that there's some notion of authorship here. Because these are cultural works, right? They kind of belong to, to everybody there. And you get quite strict fan fiction, and you get very disturbing sexual fan fiction. Um, not unlike current worldwide bestseller, Fifty Shades of Grey. I don't know if this has hit Spain yet, but um, this is currently the biggest selling book in the English language world. Um, it's erotica, really bad erotica, um, but erotica nonetheless. Um, uh, yeah, it's the biggest selling English language book at the moment. It's got the biggest selling um, 
um, book to movie deal ever, biggest amount of money ever paid for a book to be turned into a film. Um, and it's fan fiction. It started as uh, Twilight, the Twilight Teen Vampire series. Lady wrote um, uh, Twilight sexual fan fiction about the characters in, in, this, in this team book, which is brilliant, people should do that. This is how you kind of occupy these worlds. Um, um, but then she changed the names and they published it, and it's now a huge success. This, this is open design. This is the best selling piece of open design in the world. And it's come about because people already want to live in these worlds. They don't have permission to take this stuff, they're just going to go ahead and do it because they have the interest in doing it. We're just asking how do you get kids kind of interest in this stuff. So if kids aren't interested in it, like, they're doing the wrong thing. Uh, because when you, they find the interest, they will eat it up. They can't, they can't help but do it. Like this, this is the most amazing piece of creativity I've ever seen in my life. Um, this is from Omegle, which is like chat roulette, but just in text. Um, if you don't know what either of those things are, it's basically like you log on and it connects you to a random stranger and you just start talking. And that person could be anyone in the world, anywhere. And in this case, two people are connected and they immediately start writing a Harry Potter fan fiction story. One of them goes, uh, who is that? And the other one goes, it's Voldemort. And immediately, this fictional world is created, and they just start running with it. It's extraordinary. It even actually turns into like a Doctor Who crossover thing at the end as well. This is how people write stories online. This is how they appropriate the things that are already a part enough of their world. Um, if they're not doing this um, to stuff, it's only because the tools haven't trickled down far enough yet. Um, it's easy to make, to make mistakes about this stuff, to think it's smaller than it is, that it's just about the kind of flashy, showy um, examples of it, like Tupac's hologram. Um, but it's not. I think it bespeaks a deep cultural change in the way people understand cultural objects. Um, that they, don't, they no longer see any particular distinction between you know, as, as designers, you, you understand how people make things and the work that goes into making those things. Um, most people don't understand these things and they don't really care. Uh, they will take whatever it is that comes along that is useful to them at the time and transform it. Uh, what we're building are the tools for them to do that, rather than the things themselves. Um, this idea that... Uh, so this, this is slightly also personal. But sort of what happens to New Aesthetic, I was talking about this thing, and I one thought I was, I was curating something. I was taking these things and, and I was making them special um, by, by pointing at them. Um, that, I, that I was defining something very distinct. This is the way the world is. Um, uh, that I was creating essentially a kind of a gallery show of such things. And I, d I don't think that's what I was doing at all. I, I always thought of it as more like a playlist, as, um, as a way of forming a discussion by kind of dropping things in and seeing how they work, um, but by experimenting and not really worrying if this thing fits or if it really doesn't. Um, but having the ability now to constantly rearrange the argument, to constantly change up, move things in and out, in and out of the domain, kind of at will. I enjoyed that process very much. I'm going to talk about one final project um, that is related to some of those things. Uh, this is a ship. It's um, currently in London. This is the uh, South Bank Centre, a huge arts complex on the Thames in London. So this is right in the centre of London on the river. Um, and on top of the South Bank Centre for a year, there's this ship. Um, it's a project by an arts, arts group called Art Angel. Um, and it's, it's a whole number of things. One of the things it is is a one room hotel. So if you've been in time, you could have booked to spend a night up in this little ship above the river. Um, uh, it's also, they're doing kind of artistic, artist in residence stuff. They've got writers in there and music people using it as a space to do this stuff. To create this kind of temporary artistic zone up, in the, up on the roof above London. Um, and it's kind of wonderful. Hello, oh, yeah, anyway. Um, but they, they asked me to do something internet y with it. Um, they weren't really sure what. Um, so there were a couple of things that really interested me about it, a couple of things I wanted to talk about with it. First thing is, there's a whole bunch of uh, Joseph Conrad mythology around this structure. So this structure is called the Roi de Belge, 
King of the Belgians, which is the name of Joseph Conrad's riverboat in House of Darkness. Um, it's, it's kind of quite problematic to kind of name stuff after Heart of Darkness, um, unless you're quite sure you know all the ramifications of it. One of the things that I'm very interested in the ideas of colonialism that it evokes, um, and not just the historical colonialism, but the way we relate to the other now, particularly in terms of technology. On a far more banal sense, um, I was bothered that this is a broken ship, right? It doesn't go anywhere. It's not on the water. It fails the first test of being a ship. So, um, so I wanted to change that. Um, and I put a weather station behind it. Um, I don't know why I'm pointing at that. This uh, is a little weather station that records um, all weather data, wind speed, direction, temperature, all that kind of stuff, and pipes it to the internet where I can use it. And for a year now, uh, well, not a year now, since January, it will be a year, um, I've been taking that data and I've been applying it to an imaginary ship. Um, this is where the imaginary ship has gone over a year. I've been plotting it every day, plotting it every five minutes, in fact. So that when the wind is blowing five miles to the east, in the centre of London, my little ship moves five miles to the east. And this is where it's gone in this time. Flew over to Poland, down to Italy, got lost in the Aral Sea for a bit. Um, there was a bit of a computer bug here, but that's fine, uh, because, uh, because, the, because the internet has weather too, uh, and that matters. And it's sort of, it got stuck in uh, the sea down here for a bit, and it's, now, it's actually now just off the coast of India, and I don't know where it's going to go now. But it's not just a point in space. Um, it's not just floating across this map, it's floating through the network itself. Because what I'm concerned about, why I talk about um, how technology shapes the world, as though it's something abstract and distinct from us, over which we have, over which we are either masters or slaves and nothing in between. And why I'm concerned that robotics focuses only on distant evolutionary stuff and not what is what is happening kind of within technology right now is that I think I think we can, but why, why I'm interested in code spaces is because we don't need to be confrontational about stuff. There is collaboration with technology here, a very direct co-design that we don't think about strongly enough. So this robot, this machine, this mad AI airship, all the time it's going around, it's looking for information in the network about where it is and trying to construct its own picture of it. Um, it's pulling, it's looking for Flickr photos, it's looking for Twitter um, tweets, it's looking for um, uh, uh, Wikipedia articles that have a geographical location near where it is at any one time. It was looking for um, uh, personal ads, uh, but that broke. Uh, well, no, it was locked down and taken away from me. The boat was really filthy for a while. It's annoyingly not anymore. Um, but it's still constructing this narrative. It's finding all this text. It's doing the kind of same text processing um, on it that a spam bot does. Um, trying, to, trying to speak as a machine does. What it, and it's not, it's, not really, it's not really artificially intelligent, but that's okay. We can kind of push the metaphor far enough for us to think about it. It also has a, a Twitter feed um, where it occasionally speaks about what it is and where it's doing. I have no control over this. This is a software thing that's been running, running for six months now. Um, and, and you can see it every day and you can see it. And to me it feels like it's trying to understand the world. It's trying to speak back. I'm, I'm just trying to listen to its voice. I'm trying to hear the way in which it hears the world. I'm trying to feel the kind of grain of understanding it has for the world. Um, because I, I want to work with it. I don't want it to shape everything and I don't want it to, and I, I don't want to control it utterly. I just want to hear the voice of technology and see how it understands things. Because all of our metaphors for all of this stuff are wrong, deeply mistaken. For 20 years we thought about the internet, network, space. It's cyberspace. It's like it's a rubbish metaphor. It doesn't work. It's not a place. Because that implies it's somewhere distant, somewhere we can inhabit. It's not. These things are totally and utterly layered over each other. And all the tools that we create, yes, yes, they shape the world. We've kind of known that since McLuhan. Um, but but we sh it's not a, no longer a matter of we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. Because we're in this constant cycle constantly rebuilding these tools all the time. 
in order that we may shape the world differently with them. We, we coexist with them, just as we coexist with the network. And if we're going to understand how all this stuff, this co-stuff, is going to play out, as we've heard several times over these couple of days, we're going to need a whole new bunch of ways of understanding it. But hopefully we'll do that through kind of experimentation, through, through making stuff, um, from seeing how it plays out, how these, these how we live in this constant state of overlapping tools, designs, ideas, and the network. That's probably enough.